Picture a baby crying in the arms of a woman made to be a prisoner in her own home, trapped in a household defined by poverty, fear, and domestic violence. Before this baby's first birthday, this woman made the brave decision to escape the prison and take the baby with her. But now she finds herself homeless, forced to live out her worst nightmare with a crying baby in her arms. After several years of bouncing between shelters and sofas, a, a group from a local church came to their rescue and helped them find council housing and a school for the little one to go to. The baby in this story is me, and the woman is my mum. We started off in Kennington, but then moved to Roehampton, where I started primary school. In my last year of primary school, I was called into the head teacher's office. I was told there was a special opportunity just for me, and that whoever received this opportunity had to be academically inclined in their last year of primary school and come from a certain background, whatever that meant to me at the time. Only later, I found out that a charity called Bottle UK had approached my school with the chance for one of their pupils to go to a boarding school. At this point, I had already applied to secondary school. I had an idea of what, an, I had an idea of what my next few years were going to look like. But here I was, being offered the chance to go to one of the best schools in the country. So when this opportunity was offered to me, even though I was only 10 years old, I knew what I had to do. The answer just seemed clear. Not a chance, no way. In fact, when I first heard the news, I would spend hours laughing with my friends about it. Could you imagine me actually going to a school like that? A place for the elite, for prime ministers, not for people like us. I couldn't find a single person who knew anyone that had been to a boarding school, let alone even name one. Based on what I was told, I thought I would be going to a prison for kids. In the end, I was persuaded by a visit to the school and stern words of encouragement from my uncle. So in September of 2013, I packed my bag, got on the train and arrived at Kingham Hill School, an idyllic boarding school in the heart of the Cotswolds, home to Downton Abbey, the birthplace of Shakespeare and some of the most beautiful landscapes we have in this country. My first day is etched into my memory. It was the type of day where your shirt sticks to your back and your heart sinks to your stomach. The shirt, in this case, was my favorite light blue Nike tracksuit, which I paired with my pouch that had my BlackBerry 8520 and a packet of Space Raiders inside. As I walk into this boarding house, I'm greeted by my new housemates a group of about 30 boys that were not in tracksuits, but in chinos. They looked, spoke, and acted completely differently to how I did. Interestingly, it didn't take long before I started to like my new boarding school life. By the end, I had left with some great A-levels and even managed to become the head boy and head of my boarding house. But is it true? Is it true that boarding schools were not made for people like me? If they were made for people like me, then why didn't I encounter any when I arrived? And if they were not made for people like me, then why did I have such a positive experience overall? To answer these questions, we need to look at the education system more generally. In the UK, we have a two-tiered education system marked by the state and private sectors. Overall, there are roughly 32,000 schools in the UK, and most of these are in England, and most of them are primary schools. In the state sector, there are around 4,200 secondary schools, and in the private sector, there are just under 2,500 schools in total. That number also includes private prep and primary school. Within the private sector, there is a wide range of schools from the historical, confusingly named public schools like Eton and Harrow, to smaller, more specialized schools that focus on special educational needs or agriculture, for example. 
But today, when we hear of these two sectors, it's very rarely private schools and state schools. It's private schools versus state schools. Fueled by the justified anger at the inequality and elitism of our education system, there is huge public debate about whether private schools should even exist at all. And when we live in a country where 60% of all of our prime ministers have come from three schools, you can clearly see why. I've seen this inequality firsthand and I too am angered at the huge disparities in educational opportunities and outcomes. So I understand the desire to abolish private schools, but my fear is that in the crossfire, we may be destroying the missing tool in our mission to rebuild the education system, and that is the boarding school model. I'm careful here to say the boarding school model and not boarding schools as a whole, because I want to separate the model from its application. The model is characterized by four things, living in a boarding house, an emphasis on pastoral care, small class sizes, and lots of extracurricular activities. Throughout history and in the UK today, we have only really seen this model applied in a predominantly white middle class context. But what would happen if we took the same model and applied it in a community-led context? What would happen if we built new schools where the lifeblood was maintained by governors, house parents and teachers that were from the same communities or similar backgrounds as the kids going to the boarding schools? Immediately, this would solve two issues. One being that it would remove the cultural barriers that can sometimes inhibit children from succeeding on a regular bursary scheme. The second is that it allows us to provide the same transformational opportunities that I received, but on a much larger scale. This isn't the type of school where you have to be one of the lucky ones to get in. This would be the type of school where the sole purpose is to uplift and educate our most vulnerable. In this school, our kids are not the exception, but the rule. To illustrate this, let's think about the vulnerable kids on the school to prison pipeline. This is a process by which children are taken out of mainstream schools, then put into pupil referral units, or PRUs, and then to prison. 47% of people in prison in this country were kicked out of school as kids, and 30% of them were in the care system. This pipeline is so well trodden that the former head of the prison service, Martin Neri, said that the 13,000 young people we exclude from school each year might as well be given a date by which to join the prison service sometime later down the line. With such sobering and clear-cut statistics, it's undeniable that the common denominator for crime is not race or some immutable characteristic, but it's much more intimately tied to a lack of education and unstable families. Akala, one of my favorite cultural commentators, had a viral interview on Good Morning Britain where he lists four major social indicators for what he calls serious youth violence. These are lack of education, relative poverty, exposure to domestic violence, and masculinity. In the same show, Akala makes the comparison with Glasgow, which was once dubbed the murder capital of Europe in 2005, to reducing its murders done by those under the age of 18 to zero in 2017. They did this by applying a public health approach to the epidemic where they dealt with the causes, the social indicators I've mentioned, rather than the symptoms, the criminal act itself. The astounding success of this program confirms the relationship between crime and the social indicators I've mentioned. A question that is often asked is, what do these children do outside of term time? The answer is that it depends. For me, I was classed as edge of care, which means that I was about to enter the foster care system. So boarding school for me was an alternative to foster care. This was great because it allowed me to go home once or twice a month. And this meant that my mum and I could maintain our relationship in a healthy context. 
In short, these matters are decided on a case-by-case -case basis, but prioritising pastoral care is essential in ensuring that each child is safe and happy outside of term time, whether that is at school, with parents, or with a guardian. Hopefully at this point, the social benefit of this programme should be clear. But if we want to apply this nationwide, we need to understand the economics. How much does this all cost? While boarding schools are known to be our most expensive form of general education, they are actually our cheapest option when it comes to housing and educating our most vulnerable. In fact, it is cheaper to send a kid to Eton than it is to prison. Currently, through the state, if a child is taken out of their home or their school, they are most likely to end up in one or all of the following places. Prison, which costs £50,000 a year per inmate. Local authority foster care, which costs £200,000 a year per inmate. Or PRUs, or a pupil referral unit, which in these more serious cases, costs up to £250,000 per year per student to the taxpayer. Alternatively, the average boarding school is priced at around £25,000. And Eton is £45,000 a year. So even when we look at the most expensive and extravagant examples of boarding schools, we still see a dramatic difference in costs between the boarding school model and the current alternatives we have to mainstream school. The type of boarding school places I've described today don't exist just yet, but the closest thing we have is the type of program that I was on. I was sponsored by two charities, Bustle UK and the Royal National Springboard Foundation. In July of this year, Springboard published a report sponsored by the Department of Education where they used match-controlled group analysis to compare the outcomes of students on the boarding school programme to the average outcomes of students in the UK. And by the way, match-controlled group analysis is as good as it gets in terms of analysis in this field. In this report, they found that care-experienced children could be four times more likely to achieve five good GCSEs, including maths and English, at grade four and nine when on this programme. With A-levels, 98% of them left school with two or more A-levels or equivalent. And that's compared to 12% of the national average for disadvantaged children. In terms of further education, 72% of those on the Springboard programme progressed directly into university, compared with only 14% of care leavers entering university. Not to mention that in the same report, they found that programmes like these could save the government up to £2.75 million a year per 100 students saved. With this in mind, it's hard to deny that boarding schools are an effective route to social mobility and that they can transform lives. In preparation for this talk, I interviewed tw 20 very different people who were on the same or similar programme that I was on. I wanted to see if there were any patterns in the pros and cons that people gave when it came to their boarding school experience. I was fascinated to see that across the board, in the pros and the cons, they were all consistent. For the pros, every single person named, the, named one of the boarding school characteristics that I've shared with you today. For some it was the sport and for others it was the boarding house shenanigans and so on. The cons, interestingly, were just as consistent. Every single person named a cultural or socioeconomic issue. Take my friend Kieran, for example, who was the only black guy in his year for seven years. Kieran's one of my good friends. We, came, we went to the same school. And I remember at one point, there were so few black people in our school that we were all in the same group chat. Take another one of my friends, Jano who I still consider to be a success story, although he didn't finish his time at Kingham Hill School. He shared a very wise insight with me that stuck with me in writing this talk. He said, whatever it is that makes you Julian and me Jaheem is the reason why you finished and I didn't. 
So for whatever reason, in the middle class context, I was able to finish and Jano wasn't. But in the community-led context, I'm sure we both would have finished. Today, I'm in my final year of Exeter University, studying philosophy and Spanish, and I'm excited and ambitious to use the lessons I've learned from marrying the two worlds of Kingham and Kennington. But at the moment, the number of vulnerable and looked after children is sharply rising. It is a major civil rights issue in the UK. And every day I'm grateful for being put on another path. But there are hundreds of thousands of kids in this country who are just like I was, stuck in ill-managed and underfunded systems, unaware of their potential and the things they can do if put in the right context. From my own life experience and the data I've shared with you today, I know that boarding schools can change lives. And the boarding school model, if applied correctly, can change even more. Let's work together to make that a reality. Thank you.